Um, oh, and thank you to the live stream for joining with us today. Um, right now, we're just going over some announcements. Uh, we'll be at the Blue Octopus on July 20th for our community yard sale to continue to help fundraise them um, for the church. If you have any questions, just um, leave them below. Any prayer requests, leave them below. Thank you. Um, but with all that being said, is there anything Wednesday next uh, church service for special needs? Uh, no special needs service Enjoy. this month. We're going to take a break. We do, um, Jacob did tell you, we do a, a special church service for special needs people and their families. We try to do that once a month. Um, last month we did a cookout. It was really fun. But we're going to take a break this month and then we'll uh, resume in August. And y'all are welcome to come. Um, and just hang out. Our special needs friends, they love to meet new people and just talk to people. And if you have ideas of what we should do next month, probably do it inside because it's been so hot. But, yeah. but yes, we'll start back in August. It was toasty. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there, is there any other announcements that I am missing? It's somebody's birthday today. Yes. Of course. Somebody's it is somebody's birthday. birthday. Uh, it is uh, my mom and Sarah Thornton, her uh, birthday today. She is turning 25. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tom's two. I'm scared. Kid. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Um, but happy birthday from the Rich and Grace, the Rich and Grace family. So thank you. Um, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and start today's uh, message. So last week we started a series. Uh, called Christianity Verses. And last week, I thought a fitting place to start for the series was what a lot of people consider the opposite of the faith, and that is atheism. We talked about that la last week. We talked about the grip that that has on our society and what this means uh, for the world. But today, um, we're actually going to be talking, uh, we're going to narrow things down even more, and today we're going to talk about uh, our climate in America and how, as Christians, we should resp uh, respond in a biblical way manner. Um, so today we're talking about truth. So uh, starting out, I found this quote. Uh, I like to read a lot. Um, I read all different kinds of genres, like fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and I, I came across this quote as I was studying for this sermon. It's from a guy named Jay Gold. Uh, he was a what they call robber barons in the 1800s. I mean, they controlled all the business, whether it's railroads, whether it's steamships, uh, whether it's products, whether it's oil, gas, kerosene. These guys owned it, okay? So very wealthy man in the 1800s. And he is quoted as to say in this, I can pay one half of the working class to kill the other half. Okay? He was talking about how um, he deals with certain situations, um, and he was talking about um, essentially how he could get business done. And he was generally regarded as immoral in his practices, okay? If that gave a little bit of, of a flavor of how he was. But many of them reflected his ability to take advantage of the truth. He knew that the world was divided. And if the world is divided, what be better way than to appeal to one half or the other? Um, he knew that the world was divided and how to take advantage of people's uh, insecurities, their securities, and their fears. It would be irrational to think that the world has become a better place since then, um, or more united. Actually, I can argue that it became worse off. He described a polarized world, a world that we still live in. Now, I use this word polarized. One definition that I found of polarized that kind of gives um, a flavor of what we're talking about, the word polarized means divided into uh, two completely opposing groups. Uh, increasingly, we make decisions in this world. We talked about decisions this morning. Um, by, not, uh, by not examining a series of possibilities and choices, but often how we make decisions in this world, we realize it's one or the other. Or we think it can't be this, it has to be this. Or it has to be this, it can't be this. Often it feels like we are left with two choices in this world, and we have to choose one. As for our faith, that is the correct answer. In other ways, it is not. Today I want to show you that our decisions should be much more grounded in what we believe about Jesus Christ and not so much about two often poor choices that the world will try to feed you. Our goal today is to understand how and why the gospel must be the core of our decision-making abilities. This series goal is to address many of the forces and how they get in the way of biblical truth. By getting in the way, I mean this. A lot of times uh, uh, falsehoods are pushed forward by, first of all, discrediting scripture, 
We see it all the time um, with the did God really say mentality that we saw in the garden. It's still, it, uh, it's still used today. For instance, when people talk about uh, things like homosexuality, say, did God really say this is a sin? Well, I can go to Scripture. That's where you always go back. Or people try to uh, keep us from reading Scripture because there's power in Scripture, right? It's the Word of God. They uh, say X, Y, Z is more important than this. Or discredit the power of prayer. We're called to be a people of prayer, people that appeal to God. Or, but so often, you know, there's all these competing voices that say God doesn't hear you. Or to keep us from praying. Why pray? Go fix it yourself. I'm guilty of that one sometimes. I go right to go fix something, and I never stop and think, what did God say about what I'm getting ready to do? And one that scares me most as I go down this list is how many competing uh, forces and voices are around us telling us what God, what, what they think God's will is when God made his will obvious in Scripture. There's so many com competing voices that uh, tell us. Sometimes it can be political. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our political climate today um, as it affects many things in life. For instance, we could talk about abortion for a second. A lot of times this is twisted as meaning love your neighbor. You've heard it. I'm sure you have. They call it health care. Or financial prosperity. A lot of times financial prosperity is pushed as the will of God for our lives. The will of God for our lives primarily is that people are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. As it says in uh, 1 Timothy 2.4. This goes for, uh, it goes for politics, it goes for advocacy groups. It even goes for a church pastor, what they tell you. Don't always take what I have for face value. Always check me. We cannot let our faith become an us versus them, but rather a Jesus has already won the victory and go tell someone about it mentality. Um, there's a lengthy history about how American politics in particular have become this way um, and the way our climate is today. It used to be more moderate. But now it's either you have to be far left or far, far right to win big in office. What is scary about this is the fact that both sides of the pole have an agenda and often use the Christian faith to push that. The gospel is a polarizing truth in of itself. And it makes all men and women equal. Let's go to Galatians 3.28 for a second. This is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Why? Because it tells us who we are as the gospel highlights who we are to him. Galatians 3.28 In Galatians, here we are, uh, Paul was talking to a group of um, Christians who had people called Judaizers coming to their congregation and was telling them that in order to be loved by Christ, in order to accept the gospel, we also have to do X, Y, Z. We kind of talked about that already. They had all these competing forces. But he says this. He says you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to follow, uh, you don't need to follow the law. Christ fulfilled the law. What he says is when you believe the gospel, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The gospel is a polarizing truth. It stands alone. There is one way to heaven. There is one way to God. The Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. The gospel is a polarizing truth, and it makes everybody equal. It almost sounds like an anomaly, a, a paradox. The gospel is and justifies as follows. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again. And by this, he offered a spi uh, spiritual and physical resurrection by simply believing. That sounds easy because it is that easy. If this is not the gospel you have believed in, or this sounds unfamiliar or alien, come talk to me. I'd love to have that conversation with you. Um, but any other truth, uh, the gospel is polarizing, because any other truth, here's the gospel, anything else is damning. Anything else will send you to hell in a, a handbasket. And that's a scary, scary truth. There's only one way to God the Father. Salvation is not a spectrum. One message saves, and all the rest condemns. If you would, turn with me to Romans 8, 1 through 2. And that's page 555 in the Yellow Bible. 
If this message sounds a little bit scary so far, just wait. This is it's supposed to give hope and joy. Romans 8, 1 through 2. There is therefore now no condemnation which are in Christ Jesus. That sounds very specific. That are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. It's a very specific truth. Believe he uh, died, was buried, rose again for you. There's no condemnation. But you have to be in Christ. In John 17, as I was studying this, um, I found a scene where Jesus is nearing his death and he tells the disciples much about himself. He talks about how exclusively inclusive he is. He talks about how he is the only way. Uh, and John 17, 16 through 17, if you would turn there with me. John 16, so John 17, 16 through 17. I love this passage as uh, Jesus Christ tells a lot about his nature. He tells a lot about who he is. And he tells a lot about the reason that he comes. And now in 16 through 17, he, um, he says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The message that he gives is not worldly. It's not fleshly. It wasn't fabricated by anybody. It was given divinely by God himself. And then it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The only absolute truth there is. It is unnegotiable. Uh, there is no question that it is the word of God. He tells them he is not of this world. He tells them that his truth will sanctify him. We talked about what sanctify means. It means set, sets them apart. In this world of all these vying voices and forces that you hear, this is what's going to set you apart. How strictly you adhere to what God has given us. He is the only way, and his word is the only word that matters. This, tru uh, this truth is the most powerful and polarizing truth in the history of the world. Now the question is, what do we do with it? Where do we go from here? And how does this inform our decision making? Uh, early in this message I said that the gospel is a polarizing truth that makes all men and women equal. The gospel is polarizing, and grace is how we live from that uh, from that point on, as the gospel justifies us. Our fears, inequalities, our past, our future, is all preserved in grace. The grace of God makes all things right for those that believe. Christ made us acceptable, and the beautiful thing is, when he looks down from heaven, he sees us as righteous. Do y'all see yourself as righteous? It's, it's hard to believe. But looking up, you're covered by righteousness. Or looking down, as God the Father has on us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's good news. I'll continue. Philippians 3.9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. That's why we don't often feel righteous. Because it's our righteousness and we know who we are. But when Christ comes into our, our, our heart and saves us, it is his righteousness that covers us from that point on. But it says, which is of the law, and that which is through the faith of Christ, and the righteousness which is of God by faith. Then 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom, uh, made, made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. From the moment you believe, Jesus Christ did an amazing work in you. He gave us wisdom, heavenly wisdom. He gives us righteousness, covers us with righteousness. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart. He makes us a peculiar people. And he redeemed us. As righteous ambassador of Christ, we need to inform our life's decisions by grace, especially in a deeply divided world that once again has so many voices constantly in our ear. Now, we, uh, we need to know how to rightly divide the word of truth. One of the most important verses as we um, as we go into this is Second Corinthians. Uh, sorry, Second Timothy two fifteen. Second Timothy two fifteen. This is one of the verses that guides our ministry here. We try to make sure that everything that we says is for our time, is for the, uh, the body of Christ, and to us. Second Corinthians two fifteen. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. 
We all want to be approved unto God, correct? I hope that is our prayer. This is, this is how. It says, A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly divi dividing the word of truth. So as we make decisions, I'm going to get really practical here. This is how we make those practical decisions in Scripture. We must understand what parts of the Bible teach Christians how to live in grace and how to make proper decisions. Making proper decisions, if we're no longer under the law, I probably don't want to go to Leviticus and try to have that as my life book. Okay? Probably not. Uh, we must understand what parts of the Bible teach Christians how to live under grace, not under the law, which we are no longer under. We're under grace. We find this by understanding practical instruction, primarily, as I've talked about before, from Christ's apostle to the Gentile, Paul. He gives us practical instruction for how to live in this age, the age of grace, dispensation of grace. This instruction primarily comes in form through Romans, through Philemon, as given by Jesus Christ directly. This message was given to him directly by Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Romans 16, please. Romans 16, 25 through 27. I'll give it page number two. Romans 16, 25 through 27. Now, to start off this verse when you turn there, you're going to notice right away. He says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. I love, I love the word establish. Um, the word establish refers to a constant grounding of, uh, of your being. Okay? Um, he says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. This is verse 25. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which we are living in right now, with the body of Christ, we're all equal at the foot of the cross, which was kept secret since the world began. Now it was made manifest, and by scriptures of prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for obedience of faith. To God only was... Oh, let's, I want to say something about that too. We said that God's truth is the only absolute truth. It says he's the only wise. We could be dummies, right? Okay. He is the only wise. Be glory through Jesus Christ forever. He, gives, uh, he talks about the gospel that establishes us, that continues to ground us. And to live under grace is, means that we're capable or realize that God's grace is sufficient no matter what voices we hear, no matter what happens in our life, no matter what catastrophe. God's grace is sufficient to hold you and entirely sufficient to see us through our internal inheritance. You have a promise. You have heaven waiting for you. It is our blessed hope to give us peace hope, joy, and make informed decisions in this world. If you ever hear somebody say that the Bible is not practical, you know they are a liar. Mm -hmm. So, how do we live with this? So, with this truly good news, um, what does this have to do with informing our decisions in a broken, divided, and polarized world? And the truth is, the gospel has everything to do with how we make our decisions. In a message to the elders in Crete, Paul, uh, Paul writes to... Uh, uh, fellow laborer Titus in Titus 2 11 through 12 if you turn that with me smaller book towards the back it is page, right beside page 586 he is writing this to a group in Crete he's writing to a group of elders now, a little background on Crete. If you read the uh, entire book of Titus, it's very short. I encourage it. You'll realize that Crete was a very debaucherous place. Um, they lived according to philosophers, um, according to um, the Greek writers, bless you, the Greek writers of that time. This is what he says to the leaders who are up against these, I'm going to say it, pagans. Okay? This is who he's writing against. Uh, in 2, 11 through 12, he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Men referring to humankind, not just people with XY chromosome. Okay? It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I'll go ahead and keep reading. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It says... For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, catch this next word. It says, teaching us that. The grace of God teaches you. The word of God 
teaches you. The gospel teaches you to deny ungodliness. There's a lot of ungodliness going around. What is our response? Give it the gospel. Teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Think about all the ungodliness vying for your attention and vying for your approval. Lust, heinous political policies, hateful responses in life. Uh, you look around, sometimes you, uh, you see parents uh, not treat their children right, etc. Yes, the gospel and the gospel truth can teach you how to live in the light, with a light in this world. And as uh, Ephesians says, to be a children of light in this dark, dark world. It teaches Christians here in this verse to be hopeful. It says that we have a blessed hope. Blessed hope that we will see Jesus face to face. He promised, and I believe, uh, the God of this universe when he says, I will see him. It teaches Christians to understand that God is looking to redeem a lost world. A world that was once uh, in his image has now fallen. How he's going to redeem it. He has a plan that lasts all throughout eternity. He's offered it to Gentiles. He's coming back for the Jews. <laughs> he is just. He is righteous. And we can have hope that he is going to redeem this broken world. And it teaches us to seek and promote things that only align with the truth of Jesus Christ. We are called to live in, but separate from the world. The longer you live and grow in grace, Scripture guides us to meet, make more responsible decisions, to be more responsible ambassadors. And when we see something that is wrong, we can refer to what the head of the body has told us. Grow in grace, grow in knowledge of Christ, for this is his will. And it teaches us no, no, no matter what happens in this messed up world, Christ has already won. On that day 2,000 years ago, when he rose, uh, rose from the grave, death is defeated. That's the only thing we really had to fear up, in, uh, up until that point. And guess what? Christ took that away. He chopped the legs from under Satan, made him fall. Christ has already won the victory. He has made us more than conquerors, as we see in Romans, and that evil will one day come to an end. And the beautiful truth of our study in this, evil's going to come to an end one day, and guess who's going to make that call? God. Evil does not just end. God is going to end it uh -uh, in his will, in his timing. God chooses that date. So on uh, poles of north and south, right and wrong, heaven or hell, moral and amoral, Gospel truth and heresy. Choose God. Choose to finish work of Christ and believe. Now, that's not, not meaning the initial believe. That means whenever you're making a decision, refer to what the gospel has to say about that. What scripture has to say about that. Grace is how uh, God communicates with us in this time. He gives us grace upon grace upon grace. He communicates it to us with grace by his word. And grace is how we should also communicate with the rest of the world, too. It should got, uh, be in our decisions. It is how God interacts with us and empowers us to live sacrifice, uh, sacrificially and have our minds renewed in Christ Jesus. If you would, turn with me to Romans 12. <clears throat> Once again, if anybody ever tells you that Scripture is not practical, you can call them a liar. Gracefully. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's what we're talking about today, right? Going out and being ambassadors, making good decisions, living sacrificially, and be not conformed to this world, but ye, uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. The grace of God does it all. Now, as we close today, uh, if y'all would, turn with me to 2 Timothy 2.1. 2 this verse right here is the verse that I kept... Uh, I had going on repeat in my mind as I studied this. Um, this was something that I desired as a pastor for this congregation and in my personal life as well. 
is to be strong in grace. Um, 2 Timothy, in this letter, Paul is about to be executed. Um, he's about to be beheaded. He knows his end is coming, and he's trying to equip his son in the faith, Timothy, for his future, um, for the future that he's going to have in ministry. And he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you want to be, uh, if you want to make good decisions in this world, decisions that promote the gospel, that uh, promote what Jesus Christ did for us to other people, this is something we're going to need. This strength and grace. Realize our position. Realize who we are in Christ. People being renewed daily in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want to pray this over the congregation today. If you would, bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Um, I come before you again, Father, and uh, even though I know you have never left me, Father, um, you live and you dwell in the believers here, Father, and uh, we're so thankful for this. And as we come before you today, Father, um, we, we want to look at this scripture, Father, and we want to pray, uh, I want to pray this over our congregation, Father, that we be strong in the grace that your Son, Jesus Christ, has provided for us. It wasn't a cheap grace. It cost him his life, Father, and we're so thankful that our God is willing to go through that for us. Now, um, as we continue out through this week, as we continue out through this life, Father, I pray, it, um, I pray that our only uh, goal is to grow in this knowledge, Father, and to promote the gospel for your sake and to glorify you above all things, Father, for that is why we're created. I thank you for everyone here in this room today, Father, uh, and I pray they're empowered by the scripture they heard today. I ask this all in the holy, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank you to the live stream for joining with us today. If you've got any questions, comments, prayer requests, just leave them below and we'll get back with you soon. Thank you.